Hey folks, in this video we're going to be talking about electrochemical impedance spectroscopy of steel corrosion. Specifically, we're going to be looking at EIS circuit fitting of a biopolymer coating on hot dipped galvanized steel in brine solution. This is EIS data that was submitted by you, the researcher, as part of our advanced EIS webinar series led by my colleague Neil Spinner. If you're interested in future webinars by Pine Research, go to pineresearch.com to stay tuned for more. This video is broken up into several sections. First, we will describe what the electrochemical system is. Then we will talk about the various circuit models that can be used to describe the electrochemical system. We will then do circuit fitting. And based on the circuit fit data, we will use that to calculate the corrosion current, the penetration rate, and the mass loss rate. Timestamps are in the description below. And lastly, before we begin, please don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. So this first person who submitted data was running experiments with a steel sample. They were looking at its corrosion rate. And so they used a hot dip galvanized steel layer on a, a base level of steel. And they used a biopolymeric coating, which was used to try and mitigate the corrosion rate. So this is kind of the, the way they're trying to reduce the corrosion rate or fight you know, corrosion with a certain exposed surface area. Counter electrode was a platinum sheet. Reference electrode was a silver silver chloride reference. And then they, they used a shunt with a uh, 100 nanofarad capacitor. And so I'm not going to talk any more about that now. I just described what it was, but that was why I wanted to go over the shunt so you'd know you'd have an idea in your mind about what they, they used. Uh, they used a brine solution, which is pretty common for studying corrosion. And the question that the customer submitted uh, their data, this researcher, was twofold. Uh, the most common reason you know, people might submit their data to me is to ha have some assistance in what, which model um, would be most appropriate or fit most accurately, perhaps. And so um, that's relatively common. And then the other part was about, about Warburg elements. And so um, I'll answer this question right now is that um, in going back and forth with this researcher, um, there were a few fits that involved Warburg elements and one as well with a Gerischer element. I'm not going to be showing those today. I have a slightly different model um, to discuss. Uh, and, and you know, this is just kind of showing how real uh, impedance analysis is, is sometimes, I, I, very often, I should say, um, up for debate and interpretation. And so uh, in some cases, a Warburg or a Warburg short element worked uh, pretty well for this data, but I'm not going to be showing that today. Um, and uh, overall, I don't think it's necessary to have used Warburg elements to fit this data is, is what I would say to answer that question directly. And my comment back to this person was um, whether a shunt was necessary. And so I don't have an answer to that question, actually. Um, and it's fine. Because uh, I'll show you in a moment, their data looked quite good. Uh, it was very uh, seemed, you know, with very valid impedance, and was, you know, I could do some analysis. Um, but without seeing data without the shunt compared to with the shunt, as I showed uh, in my example last, it's hard to know if the shunt was actually necessary. But in any case, um, that's just something to be aware of, especially with you, perhaps if you're getting data yourself and you're not sure if you could fix the high frequency points, you might be able to try adding a shunt and see if that helps things. So this hot tip galvanized steel is essentially a layer of steel. So exactly what alloy that is, I'm, I'm not entirely sure, but it's a you know metal alloy covered with this hot dip galvanized layer, which is a some kind of a zinc or zinc iron alloy. And so this steel, Eight hot HDG steel is actually like a two layers. It's like a bottom layer of steel with a coating on it, some, some kind of HDG coating. And then this person, the researcher, put a it's their own you know, biopolymeric coating on to try and mitigate corrosion of the steel. So what we have is a possible interface between the steel and the HDG, the HDG and the coating, the coating and the electrolyte, the brine. And so that's three interfaces. Possi possible here um, with four layers, if you consider the electrolyte like the fourth layer. I discussed electrochemical interfaces usually be 
uh, having Randall's elements, which is a resistor and a CPE usually in parallel to describe where you have a solid solid or a solid liquid interface. And the analysis in the case of a film often um, will depend whether it's covered fully or not. And so basically we have these two possibilities, if you can imagine an oversimplification, which is where I have a Randall's element for the substrate film interface. I could have a Randall's element for the film electrolyte interface. And then if my either my film is porous or my uh, substrate is exposed because of um, you know incomplete film coverage, I could have this extra Randall's element between the substrate and the electrolyte. And so this was for a simple substrate film interaction. Well, this particular example here is kind of kicking it up a level here because now in this specific case, there might be four layers and not just three. And so there's gonna be two sort of possibilities here, whether the steel or the HDG is the exposed layer or not, which one is the exposed layer. So now I have a possibility of this extra layer, this HDG layer. So I have my substrate, almost like two substrates, and then my film, my biopolymer, and then the electrolyte. So I have the same kind of possibility if everything is fully covered, you know, and there's no underlying um, substrate or anything like that. Uh, I have now three instead of two Randall's elements in, in series. And then if I have my, uh, what I call embedded model here, where I have my steel, the bottom layer, let's say, exposed to the substrate, I might have a model something like this, where I have three Randall's elements, but then also this exposed um, substrate to the electrolyte as well. And then the other possibility is that, and in this one, personally, just and I'll sh we'll we'll look at the data analysis shortly as well. But this one seems more likely to me because, as I understand it, and full clarification is that I'm not a metallurgist and I'm not a professionally trained corrosion scientist, so I could certainly be wrong about some of my assessment here. But the HDG is a really is, is more of a chemical kind of a coating or, or an alloying process that it seems more likely to me that the exposed layer would be this HDG and not sort of the bare steel. And so you might imagine um, a, a, a circuit element that's maybe more like this, where I have this steel HDG, but I've got the HDG is um, the, the exposed uh, surface to the electrolyte if there's any film exfoliation or something of that nature. So the two impedance data sets that I'm going to analyze today from this person that submitted were corrosion after two different time frames. So one was after 24 hours of letting their sample corrode in that brine, and one was after 360 hours, which is about 15 days. So that is to say, basically after one day of corrosion, and then after about two weeks of corrosion. So the first thing to do is Kramer's Kronig. And this is just a simple test to check for the validity. Now you can see that there does appear to be a handful of points that are a little bit uh, just outlier, if you will. And so what I'm doing here is I'm just kind of excluding the points that appear to be kind of just outlier. They're just sort of off and that's, um, you know, not real concerning, clearly just something in the experiment might have, you know, knocked a cable or some something, um, something went a little strange there. But overall, when I remove those points, you see that this fits quite well. Uh, and this is this is really just a test of whether the data is valid impedance or not. You see the error statistic is is very, very low. It's about 0.001. I, I generally try to use about 0.1 or lower as good. Um, but that's, that's just kind of my own um, assessment. There's, there's, it's hard to give a definite answer about what chi squared the error statistic should be to be, you know, quote unquote good. It can depend on the software. On every software has a slightly different way that they calculate this, but that's for what it's worth how I kind of assess this. So now, if I want to do circuit analysis on this, I'm going to probably use some of the models that I discussed here. But even more generally, I like to try and apply the principle of Occam's razor, which again, I discussed in the previous webinar series um, and should be thought of when doing fitting on impedance data. And that is to try and apply the simplest model when possible. So what I see are two semicircles, very simply. So 
even before I get into the complicated analysis that I just showed, slightly more complicated, I should say, the most basic model that I would consider would be just two Randall's elements instead of three, right? I see two semicircles. And so when I fit that, you see that it actually looks fairly good. And so, you know, as a first um, example, it's it's not unreasonable to start here. And I, I'm also not going to get rid of the bad data points for every impedance fit just for time's sake. But, uh, you know, of course, if I were getting a most accurate fit for everything, I would probably remove every one of these bad points. However, um, this is not unreasonable. How, you, know, you can see, though, that generally speaking, this you know doesn't fit perfectly. It looks probably like, as my um, slide showed, that probably I need another Randall's element in here, and that would be to fit this you know wider peak in the blue phase angle. But this isn't a terrible fit to start. But let's go ahead and try to make that series Randall's element and see if we can get a slightly better fit. So what I'm going to do is draw a circuit. And I'm going to put three Randall's elements in series, as well as a leading resistor to try and capture that interface between the steel and the HDG, the HDG and that biopolymeric coating, and then the interface between the coating and the electrolyte. And the assumption here, at least in my estimation, is that because this is only 24 hours of corrosion, or it's like the beginning, if you will, that not very much corrosion has taken place. And so if I imagine this has been coated on fairly well, there's probably nothing exposed yet until enough time has gone by to, to you know, cause the biofilm to exfoliate or, or get sort of holes in it or something like that. And so this is probably a reasonable estimate of, of, of this fit to start, I'd say. So um, as a sort of circuit fitting tip, I tend to suggest locking all of the alphas at one for any CPE and then getting it to calculate, it's going to do a better job usually of finding initial seed values for those CPEs. And then I can let it do the final fit. And you see that this fits really pretty well. And so um, this is a good you know, estimate. I get, I get values for those CPEs and for those uh, resistors, for example, um, of, of those three interfaces. And there you go. I've got analysis of the 24-hour corrosion. Now, the second data set is after I said two weeks. So again, really quickly, what I can do is do Kramer's Kronig. And with the exception of maybe one just you know scattered point, which I won't even bother removing now just for time, uh, this data looks quite good. Maybe a little bit of drift at low frequency, but that's somewhat to be expected. And again, I'll just try a quick fit with what appears to be the simplest solution so that I can kind of go from simple to more complicated rather than starting off with the most complicated. And that appears to be just like a big semicircle with a, a diffusional, you know, Randall's element at the end. So as a first guess, I might just consider something as simple as this. And you can see here, even in the blue, it's like I kind of have a dip here and then another dip. So my, my intuition would tell me, well, I can try this. I don't know if it's going to work so well, but I, I might as well try. And Right away, I'm not going to spend too much time, but I'll just sort of show you what happens when you try to get this to fit. I mean, it looks like the Nyquist plot's getting pretty close, but the, you know, the, the Bode plot's actually getting farther away. Um, when I try to calculate this, it, it, it just won't get there. I mean, this is clearly not the right circuit, but it's close. And it's at least, you know, I could get maybe in the, in the range of, of what the capacitors or what the resistors, you know, might, might be. It could be almost like a starting point. So uh, this isn't the right um, you know, circuit to use, but I just thought I would kind of illustrate starting simple. So really what we'll try is the circuit I just drew, which is the three Randall's elements. So this is sort of assuming after, you know, two weeks of corrosion that everything is still intact. You know, th there's, there's no exposed substrate. 
And again, I'm going to lock alpha at one. I'm going to fit. And then I'm going to unlock alpha and get my final fit, assuming it is able to find good values for all the CPEs and get a reasonable fit. We got to check and make sure these values are in line. You can see here that this value is 1.00000, which is like a perfect, you know, result here that's unlikely to be that. So it's it's hit the max. You can see this is kind of indicating it's hit the maximum. I'm going to increase that by a few orders of magnitude and then recalculate. So just give this CPE a little bit more space. So clearly it needed to go a little higher. And you can see this fit isn't, isn't terrible. The phase angle kind of goes under, then over, then under. The phase, the 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 um the impedance magnitude actually looks quite good, but the Nyquist plot really kind of doesn't. So this is another one of these things. I have a you know an error statistic. It's it's not great. It's okay, um, and there's just some kind of qualitative analysis that you do um, w when circuit fitting, and, and sometimes it depends on your own tolerance and what you're looking to get out of a fit. Um, you know, uh, if you think this is really what's going on, that there's nothing exposed. It's fully covered still after all after this time. You just go with this fit and, and get the parameters you want. I'm not satisfied personally with this. You know, this doesn't really fit the Nyquist plot as well as I would like. It kind of it's clearly not 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 quite right. And I know it seems like if you just increase the resistor here, it would fit. It doesn't really quite work that way. Um, so that's why I'm gonna move next to those embedded models that I discussed. So what I'm gonna try to do is draw instead the embedded model, and I'll start with the one that, frankly, I find less likely, but we'll, we'll do both to show you um, the possibility. And that is where that lowest level of steel is perhaps exposed. And so really what I'm, what I'm doing, in a sense, um, math, even just mathematically or schematically, I guess, if you want to think of it that way, is I, I'm, I'm basically just adding another Randall's element. And so I'm, I'm kind of accomplishing two things here. I'm adding another Randall's element, which allows more sort of mathematical um, options for the, for the algorithm to solve, I guess, and, and get, a, get, a, get a better solution. Um, on the other hand, I'm not just adding something for nothing. You know, I'm adding it based on what I showed in my slides, which is, um, you know, there's there's a reason for that, right? I'm, there's there's a model behind that. So whenever you can have a real application of of your your circuit model, that makes the most sense because you can apply it to reality. You're not just you know adding. Oh, if I just throw another capacitor in here, I can get it to fit better, because that doesn't always mean anything in real life. If you can get it to mean something, you're you're going to have a more powerful argument for why this, you know, this circuit fit perhaps makes the most sense to your data. So hopefully the algorithm will find a good fit here, and actually seems to fit pretty well right away. Um, I've got uh, again one of these CPEs is always uh, getting beyond the limit, so I'm going to increase that range here. See if that kind of fixes probably this end part a little bit and, and gets it a little closer to be in line. And it does. It's a little scattered, not not perfect, I suppose, but um, you know, overall, all my my results are in range and definitely a better fit here. I've got this curvature much better, and it's really capturing um, the Nyquist plot a lot better than the previous one. So what this is telling me is that kind of what I expected is that after two weeks of corroding. Probably some of my film has delaminated, or, the, or or it's you know it's it's giving into the corrosion a little bit, and the corrosion rate is probably higher. So now the last fit that I'll try is that same model, but let's see if I can find. I've drawn it previously, so I won't spend the time. So in this case, this is like a same thing, but now I'm assuming that that exposed um, layer is the HDG, sort of the middle, you know layer here. So so that's what this other version of that right here um, model I'm going to try to apply. So again, I'm going to do the same thing. And I think in this case, I'm hoping for an example where I can show you that you have to modify a little bit, because the software does a pretty good job, but it doesn't always get it perfectly. 
And sometimes you have to kind of use a little bit of intuition to change. And then that's why these slider bars will come in handy um, to, to get try and get the final results a little bit. So let's see here if this does um, what, what, I, what I think it might do. So I'll try to get try to get this fit. So yeah, so you can see here that this actually isn't kind of capturing that end, you know, tail part here, even though overall it looks all right. So my intuition tells me that this CPE, you know, none of these are beyond the, the limit. And then every time I've done this, one of these were beyond the limit. So this, my intuition tells me that this one probably needs to be a little greater. So I'm going to, I'm going to just make an assumption that possibly this CPE needs to be a little great. You can see the curvature starts to get there a little bit better as I do that as well. Um, and one of these resistors probably needs to be increased a little. I'm not sure exactly which one. That doesn't look like the right one. So I can try to figure out which. That doesn't maybe look like the right one. I'm not sure if this is the right one. That one looks like the right one. So if I, if I kind of get that maybe a little closer, let's see if that, maybe that'll cause the parameters to lock in a little bit closer. And maybe maybe that end portion will be fit a little better. Yeah, that looks a little better to me. So this is an example just on a somewhat quick level why kind of monitoring these slider bars and finding which one kind of moves the fit closer to where I want it. Um, and so that that was a hopefully instructive way to kind of show that. Now, the last bit that I'm going to do here is a bit of quantitative analysis. I'm going to try to um, show you how you can get a numerical approximation of the corrosion rate. But to do that, I want to compare apples to apples. So basically, I want to look at the corrosion rate of 24 hours versus 360 hours. So what I want to do is I want to apply this same circuit fit so I can compare the same resistors on both of them. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go a multi-fit, which is just a batch fitting. And I'm going to select the data set that I want, which is the 24 hour. It's going to use this same circuit fit and automatically apply it so I don't have to go through the process of selecting a new circuit fit. It can apply to as many as I want. And let's see if this looks OK. And it looks like it did a pretty good job of fitting, so I probably don't have to adjust anything here. All right, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take these results. I'm going to copy them to clipboard. I have an Excel sheet ready. OK, I'm going to put these here. I'm going to come back. I'm going to get the results from my two-week, 360-hour corrosion. I'm going to put those next to it. And before I do any of these calculations, I'll just point out that on our website, this is where this information is coming from, we have a knowledge base and we have an article, a helpful article on corrosion rate. And I'm not going to get into the math right now, just for time, of course. Um, but you can see we, we talk about the resistance and how it relates to this constant B, this I core, which is this corrosion rate, and you can get down to um, corrosion rate, calculating the corrosion rate. And so the, the basically there's two common ways or units that that's used for. One is called penetration rate, which is typically um, something like a length per time that you're corroding your material. And then the other is mass loss rate, which is something like ma you know, mass per time that the material is corroding. So Basically, I have this RP, and I have this uh, these other constants, B, which I've, I've already calculated. It's constant, and I'm assuming some values for the steel. So this may not be perfectly numerically accurate. And then the area. OK, so the R, which R should I use? Right? I, just, I have five resistors. Now, my opinion is I should probably use R5, because if what I've done circuit fit on is accurate, and that may not be the case for any of a variety of reasons, but I'm just going to assume that possibly what I'm doing is, you know, relatively accurate um, analysis. Then the resistor of the underlying steel might be the most accurately related to the corrosion, I'd say. So the, you know, the biopolymer is protecting it. And so the resistance to my electrolyte where it's corroding, this R5 seems the most likely resistor to be related to the corrosion rate. So I'm going to assume R5 is the one that I want. So the first thing to get is I core, which is this corrosion current. So I'm just going to follow this equation right here. So this is equal to this constant B divided by R. I'm going to use R5 divided by the area. Okay, I'm going to get that. This is after uh, 24 hours. This is after 
360 hours. So this is B divided by A divided by R5, RP. All right, and now the next thing I'm gonna get is penetration rate, which again is like something like length per time, and then mass loss rate. And that is like mass per time loss. So I'm gonna follow these equations here and here. Again, I'm not getting into the theory or the math very heavily. I'm just gonna get these values and just show what I'm uh, referring to here. So this penetration rate is this mu EQ, it's like a molecular weight times this constant Kp times that I core we just calculated divided by the density. The mass loss rate is this mu EQ times this Km constant times I core. And then over here, again, I have this mu EQ times Kp times I core divided by the density and my mass loss rate is mu times km times i core. And so now I'm just going to illustrate these values here and say, first of all, again, that, that I've assumed some things. This is a person researcher's data. This is not my data. I don't know, of course, the 100% accuracy of here. But essentially, numerically, what I can show you is that, as I mentioned previously, 24 hours versus 360 hours, I would expect the corrosion rate to be higher after more time has gone by. And that's what I'm seeing here. You know, penetration rate and mass loss rate goes up by about a factor of three, you know, two and a half to three times greater um, corrosion rate, if you will, after more time has gone by. And that, you know, just kind of intuitively makes sense. So this is an example of of, of, of a potential numerical quantitative analysis of this kind of data. Hey folks, I hope you, you enjoyed this video. Please don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you soon.